All right, Matt Gouget, Get Better Everyday Podcast. I'm excited. I got my buddy Sabato on today. We're going to talk retirement at 51. We're going to talk maybe some gardening, maybe maybe get into the Sacramento Kings. But um, first and foremost, thank you for being here. I, I appreciate this. I'm looking forward to a fun conversation. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I've been I've been thinking about it ever since we had the opportunity to schedule this. So so thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. I like what you're doing um, as, as a lot of people experience. And I've heard this story. I haven't had it personally yet. You know, you retire and you've been a contributor. You've helped people your whole life. You're trying to find ways to give back. So um, I've checked out Ask Sabado online. Tell us a little bit um, about that, and then we'll go into the origin story and whatnot. But um, tell me the 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 birth of this YouTube channel, how that how that started. You know, it's 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 funny because if in order to understand how I got to start a YouTube channel, you have to understand a little bit about me. And so, uh, when I was about 22, a friend of mine gave me a, a book for for Christmas, and when you're 22, the last thing you want is a book because I was too busy partying like a rock star, <laughs> right? So he gives me a book, and it's the Nine Steps to Financial Freedom, and I read the book and things that I had no idea about, they started to make sense to me. And then uh, the next year he gave me um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, so I read that. And so I was, you know, it really got me into it. And, and one of the things that that book talked about was creating a personal mission statement. And so I said, you know, I'm gonna just create a personal mission statement to talk about or, or create the statement that that kind of defines what it is that I do so I know what it is that I'm trying to do. And so my personal mission statement became uplift the human condition in any way that I can. You know, knowing I wasn't incredibly talented, knowing I didn't have any particular skills that were gonna make me a million dollars, but I figured I would just help people. So fast forward through that, uh, through my career, um, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to retire at 51. And uh, my wife and I both retired at the same time, um, retired at 51. But I knew that the work wasn't done. And, and so I really spent a lot of time trying to figure out um, what, what am I going to do? And the funny part about it is the way I came up with the name Sabado was I have a neighbor. And so uh, my neighbor, uh, Abla Espanol, and so my neighbor says, hey, you know, how, what, to every day is like Saturday for you. <laughs> I said, yeah, it is. They said, oh, we should just call you Sabado. And I, I thought back to, you know, I'm a hip hop guy. So I thought back to a song by Black Sheep where they say, every day is like Saturday, my friend, go to sleep, wake up, yo, it's Saturday again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I said, why not be Ask Sabado? And, nice. and that was the birth of the channel. And it was it's really a, an opportunity um, to help people gain access to information they may not have otherwise had access to. Um, you know, what I find is that a lot of people are doing a lot of different things. And, and some people aren't doing the things they want to do, not because they don't have the skills or not because they don't have the competency to, but because they don't have the information. You know, you take people that are born into, let's say, abject poverty, they grow up and they never hear about opening a bank account. They never hear about um, what life can be like. They're, it's too busy with the struggle. And so by the time you get my age, you get to, you get to 50, um, you know, you've lived 50 years without knowing about mutual funds, index funds, and, and in some cases, not even knowing how to open a bank account. And so this was a way uh, for me to um, to represent people that look like me um, in a lot of cases, because again, I, I think people that look like me in, in a lot of categories are, are underrepresented and, and things that are equated with success. And so it's really an opportunity to to just provide information and, and create access to information to, to, you know, people of color, women, and, and you know, really anybody that has an, or to, for people that have been forgotten. You know, as I, as I retired and I, like today I'm going and I'm walking with a friend of mine who's 82 years old, um, you know, that's the forgotten generation. Yeah. And so they want to make, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people talking to them. And so it's really opening up the information and it's in a way that, is, is down to earth and in a way people can understand. And, you know, I never claimed to be a financial advisor or anything like that. Never even claimed to be one on TV, you know, <laughs> but it, it, peop, once people know that something exists and they know the questions to ask. And so that, that was really the birth of the, the birth of the channel. Yeah. I love it. There's, there's so much in, in what you talked about. And I, and I believe it too, that a lot of times it's just lack of resources, lack of education, why a lot of people, you know, go through life, and they just don't know what they don't know. Right. And, you know, great skill set. Maybe they even make great wages, but they never learned how to manage their money. They never learned about these things that, you know, somebody else given a different upbringing 
was exposed to all of it, was, was given a financial plan. Um, so I love the fact that um, you're doing what you can to say, hey, I'm a normal guy. Right. I did some pretty cool things. Got to retire at 51, get to choose uh, what I do every day, and every day is Saturday. Um, so I'd love to start there, somebody who's just starting out, right? And, and I think, you know, the audience varies, but a lot of people are, are hearing this like, you know what, you know, listening to this, you know, Sabato's gave me some hope that maybe me too, you know, I can, I can retire in my early fifties. What would be your best piece of advice? Cause I think everybody, myself included, if we, if we went back, you know, yeah, it would change yeah. some things, um, for somebody who's, you know, maybe graduating college, just starting in the workforce. What was something that, that you might recommend for them, um, from my financial perspective on on what they shouldn't shouldn't forget to do. You know, I, I think the first thing is you always pay yourself. Um, the first thing that happens, I think, a lot of times, and it's unfortunate because we live in a time where people are saddled by student debt, and so you already start behind the power curve in, in a lot of cases. And so if you have the ability to pay yourself first, um, if you're going to go into debt uh, from student loans and those types of things, don't forget to put money, uh, just put money away. Uh, some of the best pieces of information or advice that I've gotten came from unconventional sources um, in one of my videos. And again, I'm not here to plug the channel, so I don't want to go to Ask Sabato on YouTube. Let's do it. But it's, uh, I, there was a guy named John. He was a homeless guy that gave me some of the most life-changing uh, advice that I ever had. And, and I still use that advice today. And I remember every interaction with him to this day. And it was really just don't take yourself too serious because you could end up like me. And so I think the, there's two things. One is, you know, no matter how much you make, whether it's $5, whether it's $10, always try to put something away. And if you don't feel like you have anything, uh, put together a budget. Um, there was a time I, I worked at Price Club when I was a kid. It's Costco, it went from Price Club, Price Club and Costco used to be competitors, then it became Price Costco, then it became Costco. Huh. And um, there was a time when I was broke. I, I said, I don't have any money. And I, my mom sat down and said, well, let's put together a budget. And I realized that I actually had $100 more a month, which at the time was a big deal. <laughs> Right. So I, I had a hundred dollars a month and I realized I had money. So that helped me understand the importance of budgeting. Yeah. And so I think, you know, if you if a person puts together a budget and understands what their expenses are, and then they also take that any money they get and they pay themselves because over time that money continues through, you know, compound interest and all of those types of things to, to grow. So I think that's the easiest step and it's the most accessible step because at some level most people um, are gonna have uh, some money that they can uh, that they can put away, right? You yeah. know, and it doesn't have to be. It could be twenty dollars a week. It could be twenty dollars a month, but put some money away. Yeah, it's so true too. In 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 my job as a mortgage broker, I see it all the time. Um, the habits that you put in place and the habits you create when you make forty thousand a year spill over. Then you make sixty, you make eighty, you make a hundred, you make two hundred. That's right. So people who are you know financially irresponsible and they spend every dollar because they just don't know any better. They're not paying attention or they they don't want to know the truth. Um, they can make more money and have a higher top line, but it, it all still goes out the back door, you know, of you expenses. Know, you know, I, I used to have a boss once that used to talk in terms of budget, actual variance, budget, actual variance. And what you find is a lot of people operate in a negative variance. And so it's, it's, you know, and there was a time when I was there. I mean, the, the fact is, is up until about 10 years ago, I had no real idea that I would even potentially have the opportunity to retire before the age of 70. But it was taking a look and really doing a deep dive and being honest with myself about, uh, and, I, and I say myself, it's myself and my wife, but being honest about our finances and where we were. And so it went from getting bonuses at work or getting raises at work or getting tax refunds and paying off a credit card bill to having those paid off, reducing our means a little bit, mm -hmm. and then having that money to be able to put into a, a, some type of investment fund. And next thing you know, those investment funds, they, they continue to grow. Um, and it's, it's funny because there was a time where the, the markets might go down, you know, recently. Mm. And you see when they, when they go up, they don't just go up dollar for dollar. They go up exponentially mm -hmm. because of the different types of funds. And, and you get the dividends in there and everything else. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, that compounding effect and the magic of having money invested and, and compounding over time. There's the same thing on the other side where, you know, there's 18 or 23% credit card bill, oh. you know, and I see people combined income, 180,000 between, you know, husband and wife. But like you said, they're operating in the negative 
and you know the, the snowball's working in the wrong direction, right? And, and the credit card debt is be compounding and becoming more. And with 23% interest, you know, that's 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 a strong current you're swimming upstream against. Um, and and I think now more than ever, you know, people are stretched and yeah. and, and budgets are tighter. And so, um, like you said, 10 years before you retired, you you got the idea in your head, all right, this is a possibility. Um, what steps did you take? Was it, was it, here's our budget. Here's what I want to put into retirement accounts. Here's what I need on a monthly basis. I'd love to hear you talk about that because you know, somebody's listening like, man, it'd be cool to spend the, my fifties and sixties doing stuff I enjoyed. Yeah. Um, or and, nothing at all. Right? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, what, what was the, what was the, the action plan that, that really helps you get to that, you know, quote unquote finish line? You know, I've always lived my life thinking there's more than this. There's more than this. There's more than this. And so the first thing I said is, where am I throwing money away? You know, high interest credit cards. So I paid off credit cards. I said, I'm not going to use credit cards. I do have, you know, full disclosure. I have an American Express card because I use that to pay for things on a monthly basis. So I get the points mm -hmm. and I use that to, for my vacations. Um, the bank fees. You know, most people don't think about every time they go to an ATM, and what we were finding is every time I'd go to an ATM, not only would I get $5 in an out-of-network charge from my bank for going out of network, I was also getting charged by the other bank. And so if I took out $20 from another bank, I'm paying $8, so that's a net $28. Wow. So it's, it's you, in, in business, we call it revenue leakage. And you take out, you identi I identified the revenue leakage and then just said, I'm just going to put the minimum amount away so I could get the free money because most employers in their 401k plans, 401ks, 403bs, um, they uh, they'll they'll match and and generally it's a four percent or a six percent match up to you know dollar for dollar, or it's fit you know dollar for dollar up to four or six percent of your income. Right. But it's it's uh you know it's it's free money, and and I'll tell you when it really hit me was. Uh, when I bought my first house, because I wanted to buy my first house, I didn't really have any money, cash, in the bank. And I'd been putting money into my 401k just because people say put money in your 401k. I looked at it, it was $70,000. Mm. I said, whoa, where'd this come from? <laughs> and Because the markets were going up and down, so I was able to buy my first house that way. And stuff. So I just think that the first step is just to, to have the conversation with yourself, be honest with yourself, and, and put away whatever you can put away. If you could put something, just a little bit, because once you start to gain that momentum, then that becomes the game. Right. And you take away the 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 stuff you can control, take away the credit cards, take away the bank fees. Um, I, I think it's easy to say, don't try to be like the Joneses. Right. But unfortunately, the Joneses are in your face every day with all your Instagram, TikTok, <laughs> and YouTube feeds, right? So you're gonna see it everywhere and it's it's hard to resist that temptation. But just stay within, stay within your own lane, and and as I like to say, create your own lane. You know, don't don't play in somebody else's lane. Create your own lane. And I think if people could get that mindset, then they might find themselves a little bit more successful than they thought. But you know, I I think another key thing is is I think you know you touched on something: the rising cost of everything, and mm -hmm. everybody's tight. So <clears throat> when you look at something like retirement, I really tend to look at retirement a little bit different. I look at it as living my best life. And the way that I say, reason I say living my best life is because the only thing that an employer pays you for, the only thing an employee pays, employer pays you for is your time, which tells me that if you've got Microsoft, Facebook, and all these big companies paying people for their time, what's your most valuable asset is your time. And so the question becomes, do I focus on how I spend my time or how I spend my money? Because I think there's, I think there's people like you, for example, who love what you do. Mm -hmm. You love what you do. You love the growth. You're doing a bunch of cool things. You get to meet some cool people. You know, you do a bunch of cool stuff and you enjoy it. And you don't have to be in the office every day, yeah. right? So you're making money without being in the office and and doing your thing. So re it may not, retirement for you may be something different. It may be, I want to spend more time with my kids or when my kids go to college. I know you've got the, the boys. So when the boys <laughs> go off to college, I want to be able to go and spend a month with them or, you know, whatever, whatever the deal yeah. is. But you know, and identifying what your best life looks like and, and start thinking about what are the barriers for you getting there. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, like you talked about, I've heard it from a lot of different people. I think what, what most of us are searching for is time freedom, yeah. that time freedom to say, you know what, I couldn't choose to work. I don't have to, 
you know, I've got, I've, I've, I've done the work. What I want to pull out of this for people, I want people to hear this is when it comes to finances, you have to have a plan. You got to have that, That's what I kept hearing over and over. And, and I like analogies and you relate it to, you know, if you're looking to lose weight or, or get healthier, if you track your calories, you know, what comes in and, and how much you expend, you know, you're going to have a much higher success rate. And the yeah. same goes for your finances. 100%. If you're winging it, right? Um, and 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 the rising cost of things, like you said, I, I unfortunately get to see it daily. And and in my life, quite honestly, like I'm not perfect either. Um, but but I see people's finances, and I you know am coaching them. And, you know, as a mortgage advisor, I'm kind of like a debt advisor um, through their finances. And unfortunately, you know this this lifestyle creep, keeping up with the Joneses, yeah. is real. And people 100%. go from making 60 to 80 to 100. I think where I see people win, and so you know, I can just say from my experience of talking to people, is that they have that plan put in place before the pay increases come, before they they you know reach a certain uh, level of success when it comes to income. They've already got the plan, and they go, you know what? It only costs us forty three hundred dollars a month to survive. So when I'm making five grand a month, I could put away seven. Yeah. Once I start making six, I can put away seventeen. Right. And then to your point, you start doing that and then you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, which is I'm going to have the freedom yeah. to, to choose my time um, how I want. Um, I'd, I'd love to, if you don't mind, just because I'm a numbers nerd and I've, I've watched enough stuff about retirement. Like you said, I'm enjoying myself so much that I'm not even really thinking <laughs> about it. But, but the, the, the numbers aspect of it fascinates me because yeah. everybody's got a different idea. And I think there's no right or wrong answer. You know, some people like you need X number in assets. If you draw this percent um, per year, you know, this, this, this nest egg won't run out. But right. for you, sounds like 401k was part of it. I know you've got rental real estate. That's part of it. What all kind of makes up the the plan that is the, the time freedom retirement at 51 for you? Well, the one thing I do want to mention is that it's not just, ha you know, a lot of people get focused on the plan because a lot of people are focused on being perfect. And the reality is, the reality is, is that you just got to start. You got to do something. And so when I look at my plan, we have a plan. So I'll I tell you a story. So last year, my wife and I went, uh, we retired last year. So we went on a cruise. We went on a cruise to Panama. It was a nice 10-day cruise down the eastern Panama Canal side and, and all that. So we went down, and I was concerned. And I'm always concerned about money because I grew up broke. Mm -hmm. And I'm always concerned about money. And so I looked at my, uh, I, I looked at our, I looked at what we paid for the cruise and I thought, man, this is a, a big spend for early in our retirement, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew what our budget was and that would have been our entire annual budget for vacations, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm nervous, 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 nervous. Fast forward to, I don't know, 12 months or maybe 10 months from then. Because I invested, I'm now two hundred thousand dollars up from where I was then. Wow! So I've not only paid for the vacation; I've paid for the vacation twenty times. Wow! Plus, and so I, you know, so I, I think when you when you look at a plan, the best laid plans still need some revision. So I say that to say that when I when we look at our when we put together our plan, we didn't plan around a specific number. We planned around our expenses, right? And so what we what we realize is that what we are spending on a monthly basis, you know, all the da da uh, Uber Eats, the DoorDash, the Amazon, all of those things, those are all extras. But when you get down to the bottom expenses, we only needed less than half of what it is that we were what we were making. Mm -hmm. And so the way that what makes up our number is, uh, we were fortunate enough. My wife and I both had careers where. Uh, we got we have pensions, so she has a pension, I have a pension, and that's a big one because that helps us offset a lot of the costs. Um, we have our our four hundred one ks, our retirement plans, but we can't touch those. Um, too young, too young, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we put the, we have four fifty sevens, but ironically, we weren't supposed our plan didn't tell us to retire until twenty twenty six, and so we have four fifty sevens, which are non qualified deferred compensation plans um, that you can you can uh, you could. You could plan. I don't know if a plan is the right word, but you could. You let them know when you want to take the distribution. So right. you could take the distribution before. So it's it's called a four fifty seven. Anyway, so we've got money from that coming in. 
But it's really just, it's planning, it's managing the expenses. We keep the expenses low, then our pensions cover what our expenses are, and then we just stay within our means and don't go too far outside of it and let the market do what it does. So we don't have, we haven't touched any of our retirement stuff since we, since yeah. we retired, just because we've been stewards of, of what it is that we do. And I still play golf once or twice a week, still going on, we're going on an Alaska cruise in next year in, in May. So um, it's, so there's, there's, and, and then we have the, the passive income from the, from the rental property. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, you know, we have to be, we have to be studious about what we're doing, but it's, it's not, there's not a lot. It's, it's not as much as people think. I right. think. I think people think there's a there's a idea that um, you have to be rich, and that's just not the case. Yeah, that's just not the case. It's, you know, you have to be you have to be judicious about your your finances, but you don't have to be rich. Yeah, that's. I, I'm sure that's 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 great for people to hear. And as you were talking, I felt, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, peace of mind, on your part, because you know your numbers. Yeah. Right? It's not just, I hope this money lasts. I hope I can, you know, live the next 35 years and have, you know, some adventures and, and, and good times mixed in. And, and, and I hope it all works out. Like you've got the plan and, and because you have the plan, you can look at it and go, you know what, this is all it takes for us to live on a monthly basis. And, you know, you've got, is it about a year in now to retire? About a year in. Okay. Yeah. You know, you've been able to see that play out. Um, and so I think that that's cool to me. Just to see the the, the peace of mind that you well, have, and something else that that's that's important is you know if you if you have a if you have a leak in your roof you know you call a roofer if you have a leak in your plumbing you call a plumber but if you but what people don't do is when they look at their finances they don't think about going to see a professional um, and I have a financial we have a financial advisor so about uh, eight nine years ago we went and saw a financial advisor just to see where we were to do a realistic assessment of of where we were and what's cool about financial advisors is the way that we're set up, there's some fees and stuff, and I think we pay about 1%. Mm-hmm. And, and there's people that'll say, you shouldn't pay for a financial advisor. And I say, look, if you pay 1%, but make five per, or 10%, then you're paying 1% for 9%. I call mm-hmm. that jumping over pennies for dollars. Mm-hmm. And so you, it, it's worth it, the juice is worth the squeeze, as they say. So uh, I, I, I recommend everybody that's looking at retirement go out and, and look at getting a financial advisor because a financial advisor helps you not only manage the investments and look at your money and put together your plan, run the scenarios. They have what are called Monte Carlos where they have a thousand scenarios <laughs> and give you the likelihood, but they'll help you with other things that are, that are kind of gotchas that happen in retirement. So people don't think about healthcare costs. People don't think about taxes. People don't think about how they dis- uh, take distributions, uh, things like that. Taxes, the biggest, the, the biggest uh, financial risk, to retired people are taxes because when you get hit with at there's a point where you have to take required minimum distributions and and you take and you take your required minimum distributions you take social security you take all these other uh, all this other income that comes in you get taxed on it and so you get 70 year olds that are in incredibly high tax brackets and they're not working because they didn't do that planning and so financial advisor our financial advisor really helped us um, with that planning and helped us understand it and gave us the peace of mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, because again, I, I think I mentioned I'm, I'm a pretty nervous guy when it comes mm-hmm. to my money. Um, and so before we retired, we had probably six, seven conversations back to back. Um, and I said, you know, what about this? What about this? What about this? And so he was able to lay out, here are the levers that you have in case things happen. What if somebody gets sick? Well, here's, here's what we have from a long-term care perspective, and here's how you do that. Well, we have this money in savings. Well, your emergency fund, we'll put that into a money market fund uh, for you. So that way, and our money market funds, this is what he told me, our money market funds are paying $500 or 5% mm-hmm. every month. Yeah. So I'm making 5% on my emergency fund every month. I, would have not, I wouldn't have had access, nor would I have known about that had I not talked to him. And so I could live, I could pay the mortgage on my rental property just on the interest that I'm getting <laughs> on a monthly basis from a money market. Fund. Right. Yeah. And then you're getting the, the, the rental income, which the, is offset the with depreciation and other, and I get the taxes that come yeah. off of that. And, and so, but they, I, I think, you know, when you talk about the plan, it's easy for us to go out and say, Hey, look, here's a budget. I got $10 for this. So I could buy $10 of that or $8 of this and put $2 away. 
But then what's the long-term plan? Because you got to think of the big picture because you're looking at the rest of your life. Right. And that's, you know, when you look at professional athletes, that's part of the challenge is you take people who are 20-something years old, give them millions and millions of dollars. I was watching something the other day. A guy was talking about every week in the football season, he got checks for $91,000. So how do you tell somebody like that? And then what happens, though, is they get my age or they get older and they're struggling because mm -hmm. they maintain that lifestyle without and the money drops off and they don't have a plan for that so had they had a financial person that they can trust to work with then um they would have probably been okay yeah yeah that's it's always an interesting conversation whether it's a financial planner whether it's a real estate agent people are like i don't want to spend x but if you net five six eight percent because yeah. of the spend you know, that's the important part. You know, it's that uh, scarcity uh, mentality, right? <laughs> it's it's like when you're scarcity, you're like, I want to hold on to every dollar I have, but it costs money to make money. It's it's, it's the it's the it's the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. And and I learned that along. I, I went one time to North Carolina and I stayed at a hotel. I, I have a bunch of stories. So uh, I love stories. Oh, no, let's do stories. So I, I <laughs> so a long time ago, I uh, one of my first uh, real uh, professional positions. I was a junior level person. And we were going to the National Society of Black Engineers Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. So they said, all right, Bruce, you set up the hotel. True story. You set up the hotel. I said, all right, I'll set up the hotel. You know, I wanted to, be, I wanted to prove myself. So I found this hotel. It was, a, I think it was a Ramada, and it was $35 a night. So I felt like a hero, $35 a night. So I flew in the night before, mm -hmm. got there, set up, went to the uh, convention center. I'm set up. There was a guy named Marcellus. Marcellus was the director. He was a senior level person that was going to be there. And so he shows up late. And I'm saying, why is Marcellus late? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? I remember going to this room. There's this big old room. He says, uh, he came in later in the afternoon and says, who set up the hotel room? I said, I did. So I'm thinking I did a good job, <laughs> right? And he says, you know what just happened? I said, what? He says, I, on the way out, I just got pulled over. And I as I pulled out of the hotel i got pulled over by six police officers I said, what he said yeah he says because in that hotel they're known for drug activity he says what made you book that hotel <laughs> i said it was 35 dollars a night he says look get all your stuff we're gonna leave we're gonna go over to the holiday inn express i said the holiday inn express is 99 dollars a night he says bruce that's the cost of doing business yeah. and from that moment on i realized that if you want something it's gonna cost something yeah. And, you know, most of us, we want cars, we want X, Y, and Z. So what we're paying with is we're paying with our time. But yeah. even when you come with, with dollars, everything has a cost. And you're, the, what you pay should be commensurate with the outcome. So you want higher quality, it might cost you a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and so I think that when you look at financial advisors, people think, well, I don't want to spend the money because I, why am I going to give away 1% over time? And it's, it goes back to what you said, it's the peace of mind. Because right now... When, if something happens, I can call my financial person and say, should I be worried about this? Mm -hmm. Should I be worried about the market uh, volatility? Should I be worried about the geopolitical climate? And he can tell me, yes, no, here's what our advice is, and here's how we can shelter the money. Or here's what we've done to hedge against that type of downturn. Right. You know, yeah. So it's 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 key. So again, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no. Think about that was that. good. I, it's the cost of doing business. I love the stories, and 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 you're right. In 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 just about anything, you know, you get what you pay for. Yeah. I think I think my dad probably told me that when I was a kid, and 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 now it 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 truly resonates because you know you want discount service. Yeah. You know you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get a discount on it, but but you're gonna you're gonna not get as good of a product. You know, whether it comes to real estate or mortgage or whatever. Um. As, as you were talking, I thought to myself too, for a lot of people, you know, retire early has a lot of excitement attached to it. I'm yeah. still young. I can still move and, and, you know, whether it's gardening or traveling or whatever. Um, so, so there's excitement on one side yeah. and on the other side is, is the fear. And you've touched on that. Have a plan, have good people in your corner that you trust their advice um, to maybe in, in periods where you're like, Oh my gosh, I don't know if it's going to last, you know, <laughs> self, <laughs> self, self admitted, you're right. You're worried, yeah, about, you're yeah. worried about it. Um, but now I want to talk about the exciting stuff. What are the, what are the pros of being retired at 51? Because I think as I get older and I see, you know, my dad and my aunts and uncles and other people that I know that are, you know, 60s, 70s, you can't do everything you can do in your 50s yeah, when, yeah. You, when you're in your 70s. So, so whether it's golf or, or what, <laughs> what, what, are, what are some of the, 
the pros and maybe, you know, I, I'd love a story, the things you probably didn't imagine yourself doing, you know, 10 years ago when, when retirement was just a thought in your head. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I'm a music guy, so I've always been a music guy. You know, my, I'm rooted in hip hop, but I'm jazz, a little country, a little, you know, just everything classical. And I, I learned how taught myself how to play the piano. You know, it's, I'm doing a bunch of gardening. I, I think that the, the, the biggest the biggest benefit of being retired early or of being retired at all is the fact that your time is your own and then you have what I call the capacity to to think mm -hmm. because if you think about most people most people it's a pattern so you go on Monday everybody hates Monday I have a t-shirt that says you're like a Monday nobody likes you right because <laughs> nobody likes Mondays so you go in Monday and then you look forward to hump day because that's Wednesday and the week is almost over. Halfway so home. And you're like, yeah, I'm halfway <laughs> home. I'm going to make it. Friday comes. You go out and you you try to you force yourself to go out and hang out and do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And you have Saturday and Sunday to do what you need to do. But Sundays you dread. Well, again, when every day is like Saturday, you're not thinking about all of that stuff. And and the other piece is, and this is this is what I think is the hardest realization, is that most people have convinced themselves. And it's not because it's true, mm -hmm. but I think most people have convinced themselves that they love their job. I think what most people are saying to themselves is that if I had to do anything with my time, this is better some, than some other things that right. I had to do. Right. So this is the, the, the lesser of two evils. But when you take that away, then you open up the ability to do the stuff you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself busier now than I was when I was working. Um, I find myself now, so now, you know, I, I have I have my YouTube channel and I spend, I don't know, maybe five, six hours a week on my YouTube channel. I do two videos a week. So it's it, it takes some it, you know, I mean, you know, it takes some time to, right. to do my, my stuff. Um, you know, I do a bunch of gardening. I, I in fact, one of the things that I'm working on now is uh, September 10th. They're going to open up the um, applications for the UC Master Gardener program. And so I'm going to go and become a master gardener. So I learned not just about how to grow things, but I learned about soil chemistry, I learned about temperature, I learned about pH, learned about you know all of the all of the science stuff around mm. around that. Um, you know, and just and relaxing. I, I put together some. I did some home improvements. Put together a music room in my house. You know, it's just just different things. And it's you know you just never know. And I never ten years ago I would have never thought I would be doing any of this. I right. thought I would just be. Kind of living my life, mm -hmm. going to work, doing what it is that I need to do. But what's what's I, I think the harsh reality of, of working is that I think we all, whether we've whether we've identified or not, we all have an internal need to help others or to do something to contribute to the world being mm -hmm. better. Um, but the unfortunate piece is, is when you work for somebody else, then you're satisfying their need. And meeting their goals and not necessarily your goals. And so sometimes that works in harmony. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's great. But a lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times there's there's a rub because you know that there's a better way to do something, but your boss tells you something different. Right. You know that this is going to move the mission forward, but other people have a different idea. And you have to deal with the politics. You have to deal with the drama. So you can't. And, and the reality is, is we want to be our authentic selves. And I... Don't get me wrong. We want to be our authentic selves, and I think most people are. But sometimes that comes with a little bit of pushback because you can't be all things, all people. And and the reality is, and I learned this the hard way, is not everybody gets you. Mm -hmm. And so you might have the best intentions, but it might be you might be the one that's taking away somebody else's ability to to meet their to meet their dream. And so that that becomes that becomes tough. And so not to have that and to be able to help change the world and the way that I can do it in, in my small way um, is, is, is it, it, it's, it's just, it's incredible. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, you know, and the opportunity to spend time with, you know, I get into these routines where my wife and I just sit and we spend time together every, every day. Mm -hmm. we, um, <clears throat> but I also have time to do all the stuff. So you just, when you have that time and you're not thinking about the everything else, then you start to realize the value of time. And I, I think once a person realizes the value of their time, a whole different world opens up. And so that's why, and if you, if you go back and you talk to retired people, um, and again, 
you know, I'm I'm kind of the uh, the anomaly here, I guess. But if you go and you talk to you know seventy and eighty year olds, one of the things they would tell you most of the time, and I've talked to a lot, is they wish they would have done some things differently and really mm-hmm. owned their own time a little bit more than they did. And so having the ability to do that, having the ability to talk to um, people that are in that, and and to be able to to operate, it, it's just it's incredible. Yeah, it it's, sounds it's, it sounds exciting. It sounds oh, fun. Man, it, I, it it reminds me too. I've got a 15 year old son, 11 year old son. I've got nieces. Um, I'm, I'm coaching youth sports and I find myself, especially like the teenage age, like telling these kids, enjoy this. Yeah. You don't have a bunch of responsibilities. You're free to do what you want. It sounds like you get that over again, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you retire where you're like, yeah. I don't have to trade my time for money. And, and I get a little bit of freedom on, on, on choosing what I want to do. Um, which is, you know, it sounds incredible. As you were talking, I thought to myself too, because I know you said it, one thing that you, you realized you had to plug into your retired life was contribution because, you know, being vulnerable here, (laughs) I I'm sure I'm not alone. There's a lot of people that tie their value, their worth to their work, to their work. And you know, the, I, I, I'm just being completely honest. You know, yeah. somebody's like, thank you so much, Matt. This was great. I don't know how we would have bought this house without you. Like that continues to to feed me and fuel me. Um, and I've heard it from enough people where I know it's real. You retire, there's going to be a hole there where, you know, if you're not contributing, you're not helping people out. Um, and so I, I know that that's, that's part of the reason you jump straight into Ask Sabado, being able to, you know, contribute and you can reach out to a, a large audience. Um, what, what other things in retirement, um, are you doing to, to fill that need of contribution? You know, it's funny because, uh, when I, when I retired, the first thing I wanted to do, um, and not a lot of people know this, I wanted to substitute teach. So I went and got my substitute teaching credential and I actually substitute taught a class and I got in there and it was a, a middle school class. I think it was seventh grade. And I just thought to myself, I'm so far past dealing with seventh grade. That it's difficult. <laughs> so I, I came home, I got up at five, went to school. I was at the school at seven thirty, went till three. I slept until the next day when I got home wow. because it was just, it was just so much. Yeah. Um, you know, shout they, out to teachers. That's shout that's out the to the teachers. They, <laughs> they do it. Now I, I'll probably do it again at mm-hmm. some point, but uh, I just knew that wasn't the right time. But you know, we do little things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things we do. So every other Monday, what we do is we used to take stuff to, the Salvation Army and the Goodwill, and we realize that some of that stuff probably doesn't make it to shelf or mm. probably doesn't take make it to the populations that need it. Mm. So what we do is we take um, stuff that we have around the house, whether it's food products or you know clothing products or uh, cleaning pro, you know whatever it is, and we take them to the food pantries. You know around Sacramento, there's the Sacramento food pantries, mm. and they're in different locations around town, and we take stuff there because it's. You know, the, the thing is, is people in need, not everybody in need is homeless. Mm-hmm. Some people just have, they spend all of their money on houses. They don't have enough for the necessities. Yeah. So, you know, we, we take stuff there. Um, you know, I do the, I do the YouTube channel to, to try to give back. I, uh, and I'm constantly trying to find ways and opportunities to, uh, to do different things. I had a conversation with a guy that is an insurance individual, and he wanted to talk about, you know, reaching out to kids and talking to them about financial acumen. You know, how to deal with how to deal with money. I've done some. Uh, I was I was part of uh, in Oakland. There was a uh, there was a uh, there's a group called 500 Black or 100 Black Men, and uh, what they did is they had a, a, a thing at school where they had professionals come in and talk to the school. So you know, it's it's really whenever there's an opportunity to give back, um, you know, we we jump on that because again, when I when I think I'm too tired to do something, or I don't want to do something. There's always that question, and my wife will remind me. You know, does this? How does this uh, move your mission statement forward of uplifting yeah. the human condition? So it's it's really about finding ways. And you know, I think another way of giving back too is, um, you know, on a more personal note, is just trying to be a better friend, trying to be a better human being to people, and taking time uh, for the people that that have cared about me through the years, right? Mm-hmm. And because again, when you're when you're moving through your career and I mean you know this as well as I do once you get going you got to get going and you almost have to have some type a attributes in order to right. be successful and, yeah uh, you lose um you know you lose touch with the with the human side of people sometimes and so I've really been spending a lot of time you know doing doing some of that so it's 
there's just there's just a lot that that goes in, and I, as I and I think with the Master Gardener program, and I, I don't think I mentioned this, is that one of the things that the UC Master Gardeners do, and are required to do, which is I think exciting, is they go out into the community and they teach um, kids about gardening, and they teach the community about gardening. In fact, the way I learned about it was at the Home and Garden Show, and there was a Master Gardener that I sat there and talked to for about an hour about wow. stuff. Um, you know, and, and things like, you know, beekeeping and stuff like that. So, um, so really just trying to take, you know, whatever gifts, whatever opportunities come my way. Um, right. Cause again, I don't, I don't have the, uh, the public persona of an athlete or, uh, any of that. So it's not, I'm not getting pulled by millions of people to do a bunch of stuff, but when the opportunities exist and I seek out when those opportunities mm -hmm. exist, I do it, um, um to, to, to give to whoever I can, however I can, and help in, in ways that I can. Uh, because the, the reality is, is most of the time, I mean, some people need financial help, but there's so much more that could be done. And it's not always about the big things. It's about what are the small, the small incremental things that we could do to, right. to help people get to a better place in their lives and, or even just, just feel better about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think too, like the, you know, you've said it, the, the financial piece, the education piece, that's probably, you know, teaching a man to fish far more valuable than, than giving him the fish. And yeah. so getting out there and, you know, teaching kids about financial literacy. Um, I want to kind of bring it full circle um, because I think that you, you started off by saying, you know, I did it, you know, I didn't have, you know, money gifted to me and, and, and I wasn't handed down stuff. Um, Tell me a little bit about your origin story, your childhood, um, so that people can see this and say, you know what, Sabato did it. You know, he yeah. he was able to you know create this this great life, time, freedom. Um, so so so, what's the origin story? Mostly, honestly, so that people can look at it and go, you know what. You know, this, this guy didn't come from a trust fund. He didn't, he wasn't, wasn't, you <laughs> know, handed a, a, a $20 million uh, NBA contract. I know, I know, uh, I think it was injuries that, that uh, yeah, kind yeah. of thwarted that, but, but at least yeah. that's my story. Yeah. That, that, that's your story. You're sticking to it. But yeah. What's, what's the origin story? Give people hope that, you know, it's possible. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I can't talk about uh, where I've become without talking about my parents because mm -hmm. I, I think my parents were, were key in me becoming who I am. And so, you know, my parents are from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, for my parents' generation, as we know, that was the heart of the Jim Crow South. And so for people of color, uh, for black folks to succeed, it just wasn't something that could happen. So my dad went to the uh, Marines. He went to go join the Marines. And at the, in his neighborhood, the uh, recruiters were at the bottom of the post office. And so he didn't, uh, the Marine person was out to lunch. So then he ended up joining the Air Force became a master sergeant in the Air Force, which is a big deal on, on a lot of different levels. And he had told me stories about times where people treated him different in the military. And so how he used the system to um, get what he needed to get, you know, not to get anything extra, but to get uh, his, his fair share. And so it's, you know, growing up, I was watching my dad up until, you know, the 1980s, whenever he retired, um, I watched him walking around uh, the base and, and people were saluting him. So I knew he was doing something. And, and it, again, I didn't process it that way at the time. But as I, so, and, and what's interesting is that um, I was adopted. A lot of people don't know that I was adopted as a kid. And so I, uh, so growing up, I was reading books about adoption because you just don't know. And there was a time when you have to, uh, when you had to go into encyclopedias. And so we had encyclopedias. We had two sets of encyclopedias yeah. in our house. Uh, uh, Collier's, which was the adult encyclopedia, mm -hmm. and we had the new book of knowledge, which was the young. I, that's how I had them in my mind. So I'm reading about adoption, and I was reading all these statistics about adopted kids and being in prison and incarcerated. So you take that on top of everything else. I didn't really have any prospects, but my my father started teaching me really young that you know you have to be in order to get to where you deserve to be. You don't want to be like everybody else. You have to be an individual. Mm -hmm. And my my and, and anybody that knows me. They're gonna say, you know, Sabado's cool, but he's a different cat. Cause I just I just operate on a different frequency than, than 90% of people. And then people that I really connect with, like yourself, mm. you know, we stay in touch and we've known each other for a lot of years yeah, now, you yeah. know. So it's but it's um so I, you know, so I we grew up and and again, a military salary isn't isn't um, um it's not uh, you know, military salaries are never big. Yeah. They're never huge. And in fact, I hear stories about how my parents had to save money week to week in order to cover the rent. A hundred dollars a week 
or a month in rent. They had to wow. they had to save money when you go. So just to give you some perspective. Yeah. Um, and so my so when I when I was a kid, you know my my father was always my parents were really really strict. They were they were they they said you you have to know how to read, you have to know how to write, and you have to know how to speak. Uh, when I was in college, uh, my dad told me one day that he says if you ever want to make change to the system. You can stand on the outside and, and scream at the system, or you can get inside and make changes from within. And so that's that's what I did. Yeah. And uh, and uh, when I was in when I was thinking about whether or not to go to college, the, the conversation was you either get a job and pay rent, or you go to school. And so I thought I was going to go work at UPS. I had a neighbor across the street that worked at UPS because at that time UPS was a good job. When I was when I was in college. He was making, I think, eighteen dollars an hour as a driver for UPS, which at that time was incredible money. Mm-hmm. But then he hurt his back, and so I knew that wasn't going to work. Yeah. And then um, when I was in high school, thinking about when I was thinking about it, uh, the, at our high school, all we had were Navy rec- or Army recruiters that would come, and so I went to go talk to the Army recruiter, and the uh, Army recruiter says, I, I, he says, you know, he tells me all the good stuff about the Army. Then I said, what time do you get up to go running for boot camp? And he says, everybody gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning and runs five, five miles. And I said, you know, I'm not going to do that either. <laughs> so, and, and I was at a high school that on the first day of my high school, the vice principal got up and told everybody that, look to your left because there's a chance that person doesn't graduate because there's a 55% dropout rate. Wow. So anybody that goes and does the numbers, you know, you start looking at the, the demographics of, who's impacted the most, and it wasn't people that would look like me that were graduating at, at high clips. Mm-hmm. But, I, but I had the opportunity to, uh, to, to meet some good people along the way. Um, I always stepped outside of the box, and my father was always, you know, step outside of what you're comfortable with. So I went from the side of town that I was in to the other side of town. To the, um, there's, so I grew up in a city called San Jose, and so San Jose has the east side, which is where I grew up. And then there's a town called Saratoga. And Saratoga is affluent. It's a really mm-hmm. affluent area now that you're in college there. So I went to school there. And so I was able to see a whole different side of the world and interact with people in a different way and realize that when I was there, those folks were no different than me. I just had to be able to navigate and, and move in such a way that um, and communicate in such a way. So my father was always really big on how do you communicate and so community you know and i'll tell you a funny story so years ago when i was in high school i had a friend named danny anderson and danny and i were at my house and i was on the phone with a, with a girl named candy who was a friend of mine mm. uh, I, I guess she was a friend i, I don't know, you know <laughs> we won't go there but no I, had, I was on the phone and um my dad i was my dad was upstairs and so at this time we didn't have we didn't have beepers we didn't have cell phones we didn't have any of that. so she's on a pay phone <laughs> And I'm on the home phone, and I say, hey, where are you at? My dad from upstairs mm-hmm. says, it's not where you at, it's where are you, you are. <laughs> right? He says, if you want people to take you serious, they have to understand what you're saying. So you have to learn how to speak the language. Mm-hmm. So I, so from that point on, I always, I always spoke the language. And as I continued down the path, um, you know, and I, I got taller, I realized that when I walked into a room, people paid attention when I was there. But I still didn't didn't have any skills, so I, I ended up going to school. Uh, and when I hurt my knee playing basketball, I, I had to make a choice because my dad said, "You either get a job." I think I mentioned you either get a job or you um, you either you either go to school or you pay rent. Mm. And I didn't want to pay rent, so I I so I finished school and I wanted to prove. It's funny because what I wanted to prove when I went to school was that um, you didn't have to be some incredible individual. To go to school and that mm-hmm. you could be this normal guy mm-hmm. and go to school and that's what I did and through the whole time I was always working with kids if I had the opportunity to intern I'd intern at elementary schools uh, just and not you know not telling the story I mean now you know we're, we're in this place where we're telling the story and you know we're these individuals these uh, these these wise sages that, <laughs> that tell the story but it wasn't about that it was just being there because you know, it's 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 hard to realize and understand that a lot of kids, a lot of young people, grow up without a male in the house, mm-hmm. and so then it creates a couple of things. It creates the a difficulty in res, in respecting male figures, uh, and and listening to male figures, um, 
and actually just just interacting um, with male figures because all they all they hear is negative. Mm-hmm. You know, the mom and the dad breaks up. So so anyway, so I I, I went to uh, so then I ended up going to school, went to San Jose State, and uh, and graduated, but then didn't know what I was going to do and started working with elementary school kids and uh, as a counselor at an elementary school. And it was funny because uh, it was for kids with like attention deficit. It was a day treatment program, but it was kids with attention deficit disorder and stuff like that. So I started working with these kids, and what we saw was the goal was to mainstream the uh, to get the kids to the mainstream, uh, which means get in normal classes because right. they were in this area that was kind of fenced off mm-hmm. because they were they were seen as different. They were the others, mm-hmm. and so it was myself and a, and a good friend of mine, Lawrence, who's, who I'm still good friends with today. And what we said was, is we're going to treat these kids like uh, normal human beings. And so what we were finding is a lot of these kids, because people either felt sorry for them or afraid of them, they treated them different. Right. So here we are, you know, I'm 6'8", um, and I come in the room, and they kids just think that's cool anyway. Mm-hmm. And I start treating them normal. Next thing you know, kid after kid starts to mainstream, all because, not because we were these psychological gurus or any of that. Mm-hmm. We had therapists on site mm-hmm. for that. But because we treated them normal, and so so I did that for a few years, and then realized that um, you know this is great, but at some point I've got to try to make some money, and this was around the time of the tech boom, and then I uh, went in, did some recruiting and some of that, and then had to reinvent myself with the two thousand. This is this goes back mm-hmm. when, in, in two thousand when you had the bust. Um, I I went into um, I, I pivoted to, to human resources and then never looked back. And so that was the last two decades of your career, human resources decades, stuff. Doing a lot of, and, and one of the things that I, again, in the spirit of giving back, I had the opportunity to uh, to work in what's called learning and development. So myself and one other guy, uh, he told me, he says, look, if, if we don't get this right, uh, we're both going to be out of a job. And uh, I had young kids at home and, and stuff like that. So, I, you know, that wasn't an option. We developed a leadership curriculum called the Essentials of Leadership, and it uh, became the global standard for DHL. So DHL, a lot of people don't realize this, but at one time, DHL was the second largest. Uh, Deutsche Post DHL was the second largest employer in the world behind Walmart. Wow. We became what we developed was the global standard for leadership development. So it was, and what started as one class turned out to be twenty six classes and became DHL University. So. Um, you know, we had the we had the opportunity to do that, and it's it's funny because it all came from the idea of not having a bunch of skills, taking my own personal attributes, being able to leverage those. Because if you put me in front of a group of people and you give me some material, mm-hmm. I'm gonna get after it, yeah, and I'm gonna do it in the right way um, because I le- I learned how to speak, but just trying to give back and and getting inside the system. So what it's done is it it gave me the opportunity, you know, to to again, it's it's not until recently that. I've become kind of this quote unquote, you know, old sage, <laughs> wise, uh, yeah. have the sage wisdom, but um, just being in the in the place because then what happens is people see people that look like them, um, and then that tells kids, I can do it. Yeah, you see, it's, yeah. I can do it. You know, you look at your boys. Your boys mm-hmm. probably like, you know, they, they probably like sports or music or something. Right. And there's somebody they look at mm-hmm. and they say, I can do that. Right. But if it's somebody that is opposite them or that they perceive as opposite or is different, then they say, well, they can do it because they're this. Right. But right, I'm not going right. to be able to do it. But if they say, that person looks like me, mm-hmm. then they can, then they feel like, okay, if they can do it, I can do it. Right. Which, which, which as, as you're talking, it's just, it's kind of cool to think about, you know, your dad giving you the advice, like make the change from the inside. Yeah. The best way for you to impact, you know, future generations, kids that look like you, talk like you, act like you, is, is to go out and have some success. And then they have something to model. They go, look, you know, this is this is somebody who did it. Um, I'm interested too that journey. Um, and thanks for sharing the the story because I, I love I love a story and you know how you came to be. I'm all stories, man. Where 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 in the story um, does financial literacy get injected? Because I think that's that's the missing piece for a lot of people. Where you know, oh, I've got the work ethic, I've got the drive, I can go out there and I can add value to where an employer is going to you know pay me um, good for my time. The missing piece for a lot of people, especially if you talk about people that look like you and and come from you know a place like you, yeah, um, they're they're that's the piece that that a lot of them are missing. 
you know, is they haven't had that financial literacy injected into them. You know, it sounds like you got into the, you know, right environments, right rooms where that information was available, but where, where did it come for you? And and where do you think um, people should go look for, you know, that financial guidance maybe? You know, it's, it's funny because being in the right rooms, a lot of times for me was, it wasn't, oh yeah, come on in. It was, who's this guy? Yeah. But then I I knew that I had to prepare. I mm-hmm. knew I was prepared enough to be there and that I deserved to be there and that I was going to, if I was going to, if I was, if I wasn't going to make it, I was going to die trying. Mm-hmm. Right. But it, it really happened uh, around my, my 22nd, 23rd birthday. I was, I was out of school, didn't know what I was going to do. And I went to my mom's house. And when I was there, a buddy of mine, a guy named Bobby Cruz, I call him the 8084. The 8084, because it's in beeper language, Bobby's 8084. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he comes to the, he comes over and, you know, so I'm talking to him and he's like, I got a gift for you. So I open up the book and I think I got it backwards in the first. So it was the seven habits of highly effective people. Mm. So he gave me the seven habits of highly effective people. And I looked at it and I think it was, it was either a book or a book on tape or something. But then I said, you know, this makes a lot of sense. The next year, now, I never said, I said, thank you for the book, because I, I always said, if somebody gives you something, you appreciate it, because right. they could do live their whole lives and not give you anything and be mm-hmm. fine. And, mm-hmm. and then that's how people get forgotten about. And so the next year, he gave me another book. And he says, you know, you liked the book last year. I, I want to give you this other one. And it was The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom by Susie Orman. Mm-hmm. And in this book, it talks about, it goes A to Z, and it's really easy to read. I mean, I, I think people have kind of taken it and and... And they've made things really complicated now um, yeah. from, a, from a book. But this one, it, it talks about living trust. It talks about 401ks. <laughs> it talks about long-term care insurance. It talks about these nine things. It talks about how to save money. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of being broke. So maybe I'll take some of these lessons and, and do that. Yeah. And that was it. That was the impetus for me. And I said, you know, because I, because again, it's, um, you know, it's what was ingrained in me is that you could talk about it or you could be about it. Mm-hmm. And so my thing was, I'm just, I don't want to be broke, so I got to do something about it. Right. And so I started put, I just started putting that money away. And I, and and I just listen to people. I, I listen to people talk. Um, I listen to, you know, I think I could recall one conversation you and I had, and I still use the information from this conversation is. We were looking at rates, and I said, "Look, when do rates go up and down?" And you said, "Well, the rates are already uh, the 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 Fed's interest rate are already priced into the loans." I don't understand that, but I get it. So I know that when the rates go down, that the mortgage rates aren't going to automatically drop. Right, the, right. It's not a one for one necessarily because it's all, they've already come down in anticipation of it. Right. That. We know it's coming. And so now, when I look at <clears throat> different channels, there's a guy I watch now who every day gives a financial update. And then you start looking at the the probability of rate cuts, it starts to make sense. Mm-hmm. Because, okay, so this is what Matt was talking about mm-hmm. because they they have probabilities on what the Fed's anticipated to do at this time, and so they rate they put those into the rate. Right, and the market knows that. The it's market not, knows yeah, that. Yeah. And so what happens is um, I would get these pieces of information, little small pieces of information, and, and people would – and I'll tell you one story that, that happened when I was uh, a recruiter, and I, I wish – you know, I, sometimes I look back and I kick myself. And I, I can't really kick myself at being retired at 51, but I still kick myself sometimes because there was a guy one time, a guy named Panos. And I hope if at Panos, if you're watching, you know, <laughs> reach out and let's get in touch. But um, he came to me one day and he says, hey, you know, I've got, um, you, do you have $10,000? And so I was probably 25, 26 at the time. And so I just kind of laugh at him. Right? Right, yeah, it's a lot of money. I'm like, come on, man, <laughs> do I have $10,000? And, and Panos comes from a family, a Greek family that owns islands out in the Greek Isles. I mean, it's, it's insane. But he's like, you have ten thousand dollars. He says, I, I want you, I want you to invest in this thing. This is what he told me. Mm-hmm. I want you to invest in this thing. I said, well, I don't have ten grand. I said, what is it? He says, well, they're working on this software that if you're going, if you're, if you want to go somewhere, it'll tell you where you're going, how to get there and the different stuff along the way. And this is the first time commercially that they're gonna use this uh, software. And so I said, what is it? He says, it's called GPS. This is when I was 26 years old. 
and this company was developing. So now, you know, you get on your phone and you get on, you're like, hey, Siri, you know, tell me something good or whatever, to, whatever you want them to say. Right. This was the, this was the, the, the kickoff of that. And I had the opportunity to, to get in there. And, I, you know, and I, it's funny because there's been a few things that have come up where people have said, hey, you know, give us this for that. And now I'm at this point where, you know, I might say I'm going to go buy some NVIDIA or something like that mm -hmm. because I have enough knowledge. But at that time, I didn't have it. But, it's, but I realized a long time ago that there's all this information that sits out there that sometimes we don't listen to because we think it's wrong. Sometimes it's, we think it's misguided, and a lot of it is. Right. But being able to listen to information, pay attention to what people say, understand what people say, do my own, I think, independent research. And, and again, not, I, don't, I wouldn't say YouTube research or any of that. I mean real research, you know, pr what I call primary source verification of documents that are related to that by the experts in that. To determine what it is that I'm going to do, and and once I got into that, um, it made it made everything it, it changed everything for me because, you know, now uh, one of the things that I do that that bothers people a lot is when people say stuff, you know, and again with, with all this stuff out here in the in the ether, people have a lot of opinions, but I say, well, what is this? What's the what's the fact? And so I'll go back and I'll research the facts. And I say, mm -hmm. well, you know, the facts are this, and it's hard for people to process mm -hmm. some of those facts sometimes. There's not a whole host of things, but. So it's it's just a different, um, you know. Again, I, I got lost in in the statement, but um. yeah, I mean, I think I think the main thing is, you, you know, there's there's so much out there. Yeah. You went and you know you you had to seek it to a certain extent. You know, twenty five years ago, their podcast didn't exist. You know, yeah. YouTube stuff didn't exist, and and so with with that a massive amount of knowledge out there in the universe, yeah. it's easier than ever. For somebody, and this is you know takeaway advice for people listening, um, the the resources are out there, yeah. And there's people that have been highly successful that have come before you, you know, same upbringing or or worse, you know, different circumstances that have had success. And most of the people that have had success, you know, whether it's in business or or, or finance or whatever, they want to give it away for free. They yeah. want to share right. that that gift with others, um, and so. You know, you don't even necessarily have to go check out a book from the library or something. You can you can search on your phone. You know, yeah. I want to learn about 401ks. Maybe the, you you listen to something that Sabato said today and you said, oh, he mentioned a living trust. I don't know what that is. Go research it. You and know, once you know, see, there. the thing is, once you know it's there, then you know that there's a what the question is to be to be asked. You know, the, the whole idea isn't to answer everybody's question. It's to let people know that there is something out there. So there's so that, to know to ask the question. Right. Because if you don't know that it exists, you don't know to ask about it. Right. And so it's uh, it's it's really about making sure people have access to to knowing that something exists. Four hundred one ks exist. It's, again, people don't. There's some people that don't know how to open a checking account. Yeah. And there's some people that don't know that there's other ways to save than putting money in in a savings account. And there's a lot of people because a lot of there's a lot of people in our in our country that don't know. You know that are that are living, and I don't want to say living paycheck to paycheck because I think that's that's generous for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. but they're they're really living on. You know, if I could just get this, you know, I, I want to pay my rent, so if I could just get fifty more dollars, and I'm you know, so they don't have, and they grew up that way, so they don't have the time, and their parents didn't have the time to go out and figure those things. Right. Yeah. Like you said, operate in the negative and, and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully some of these messages landed with some people. I appreciate the heck out of your time, man. This was fun. Um, any parting words for the get better every day listener? You know, I just think that, um, you know, you never know uh, where you're going to get some good information. I, I, I do want to share one story. Okay. I, I got to tell you the story about right. John right. because I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people that fi try to find ways to, to kind of take information and say, well, you know, disabuse it right away. You just never know how it's going to work. So I, I tell you a story. So when I was in college, I, um, I used to, believe it or not, I had this big old afro, and I used to wear headphones every day because, again, I was a music guy, mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd ride the bus because I didn't have a car. I'm sitting at the bus stop, and as I'm there, this guy comes walking over across the street. So if you can imagine a street, the crosswalk's maybe, you know, 30 yards this way, and the street is right in front of the bus stop. And he comes walking across the street with this little twitch. 
right in the middle of traffic. Cars are skidding so they don't hit him. Mm. And he just walks up, right? Homeless guy. So I, he comes up to me. I had my headphones on. Mm. And part of the reason I had my headphones on is so I don't get interrupted by people because everybody's asking for money. Right? Mm. The guy comes up to me, says to me, um, hey, isn't Howard University, I was wearing a Howard University t-shirt. Mm. He said, isn't Howard University that black college in Washington, D.C.? So I look at him, and I'm thinking to myself, how does this guy know about <laughs> Howard University? He's a white guy, too. Not good. Look, I'm, it's not that type of situation. But, it's, right. but I'm saying, how does he know yeah. about a historically black college in Washington, D.C.? Mm-hmm. So I said, no. I said, I go to San Jose State. So he tells me, he says, I went to San Jose State. I said, really? So I took my headphones off. Mm-hmm. And he says, yeah, I was going to San Jose State. I was getting my double major in finance and accounting. And I was working full time, taking 17 units. Then I had a nervous breakdown. And I just happened to know that um, uh, and became a paranoid schizophrenia, schizophrenic. So I, I happened to know that at that age, in that age range, that's when people were vulnerable to the onset of schizophrenia, mm-hmm. right? At, at least that's what I read somewhere at that time. But anyway, he says, I became a paranoid schizophrenic. He says, so I want you to do me a favor. I said, what's that? He said, never take yourself too seriously or you might end up like me sometime. Wow. So he was telling, what he said was, again, I want to be clear, 17 units, double major, working full time, doing too much, had a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. And now he's in the state that he's in. So I said, all right. And his name was John. Never forget the guy. Mm -hmm. One of the the two most important pieces of information I ever got. The other one was was my, my dad talking about the system. Mm. But uh, so he says to me, so he says, I said, I promise. So then about a month later, I'm in front of the student union. And if you know anything about San Jose State, San Jose State has a student union and it has a, uh, outside the student union has a bunch of benches and chairs. At least it used to. I don't know. That was 30 years ago. <laughs> um, and so I'm standing there talking to my buddies. And, you know, I'm 6'8", buddy 6'5", you know, all these tall cats. These cool cats, right? We're the cool cats. We're all tall and stuff. And in the corner of my eye, there's this puddle. And so I'm, I'm just showing out, and I see this puddle, and there's birds in the puddle. Can't make the stuff up. Somebody comes shuffling through the puddle. I see the birds fly off out of the corner of my eye. I turn around. It's John. John walked right up to me, stood right in front of me. And people don't usually, when you're 6'8", people don't just usually <laughs> come and stand up right in front of you, right? Yeah. It's, just, it's just a thing. Yeah. So he came up to me, looked at me. He says, you doing all right? And I looked at him. And in that moment, I had such clarity because I knew exactly what he was asking. Yep. I said, I'm good. He's like, all right, take care of yourself. He shuffled away. I never saw him again. That relationship has stuck with me from that day, and that wow. was over 30 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And so yeah. whenever I get into these situations, I try to take myself too serious. So I think from a parting words perspective, it's the, the idea of early retirement is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And it's not realistic for some people. Mm-hmm. But living your best life is taking control of your time is, and so I think if, if as a as a person, I think the idea is, is figure out how you want to use your time. Start thinking about how you can get yourself to that, and then when you start thinking about the money side of it, just go after the free stuff first. Mm-hmm. Because once the free stuff starts to build, then the rest of it starts to come. But if you start with the end in mind and you say, "I want to get to a million dollars, two million dollars, three million dollars." That's going to be overwhelming because right. we still have to live our lives. Yep. So, you know, don't take yourself too serious. Um, you know, enjoy the journey and realize that your most valuable resource is your time. And as long as you keep that in mind and you enjoy every moment, how you spend it becomes the means to an end. But the end is that when you're 90 years old, you have a good story to tell. I love it. That's it. Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That was